All right, so let's uh, take a look at the solutions to the Git breakout session. Um, all right, so the first thing which I hope worked uh, for everyone was uh, the git clone command. So it's basically just uh, downloading uh, all the code in the git repository. Actually, I want to do that from a different directory. OK, so if I do an ls, um, I've got this bloom demo folder. So I'll cd into that, take a look around. So um, first thing we should do is just uh, take a look at the readme. OK. Um, so this basically gives us uh, some background on what this Bloom filter uh, actually does. And um, you know, since Git is all about workflow, um, you know, I won't be showing you any slides. I'm actually just going um, to do the, the exercise for you. And you can sort of um, type along with me and see how many mistakes I make. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the instructions. Okay, so um, the first thing uh, we're supposed to do is to check out a, um, a new branch uh, called work. Um, so when you get a, when you clone into a git repo, um, the first thing I'd recommend doing is just doing a git log um, and that basically gives you a succinct view of the commits, um, or, you know, ordered in reverse chronological order. So basically, the most recent ones um, are at the top here. All right, so this was the last thing to be done before we cloned it, okay? So um, basically, uh, when we create a, a new branch, we're creating an identical view of, uh, of the code base. So right now, we're on a branch called master. And then when we create a new branch called work, initially, it's just going to have the same code in it. But then we'll change that and keep track of our changes. All right. So um, we can do git uh, branch. And what that does is that lists all the branches um, there are. And right now, there's just one. And then git branch with an argument will create a new branch. All right, so you see that there's two branches now. Um, and then the asterisk um, tells you which branch you're on, um, which branch you're, you're changing. So then git checkout lets us move to a different branch, work. OK, so now we've switched to the work branch. Um, and if we do git branch, the asterisk is moved. OK. So um, all right, so then now on to, uh, to question three. Um, OK, so we're going to add a feature to the, pro to the program uh, in dict um, that basically prints out the false positive rate. OK? So let's take a look at the file. OK. So um, an option is basically uh, you know, like a command line um, flag. Um, and you can see that there's already an option uh, to basically uh, skip the things that are not, the words that are not in the dictionary. So um, I'll just run the example that are, that's uh, in the readme. OK. So uh, that's without the option. And then running it with this dash s um, basically removes all the things that are definitely not in the dictionary. All right, so now we want to add um, a function, uh, an option to this file, to this program, which lets us print out the false positive rate. All right, so I'm basically just going to follow this template, going to define um, a new variable. Uh, called, let's say, print fp. Uh, give it a different flag. And there's a more um, elegant way of um, passing flags um, at the command line, um, but we haven't got into that yet. So this is, you know, as it says over here, the poor man's 
argument handling. Okay, and then I'm just going to make a small modification um, to what's being printed out. Um, so I'll say um, I'll define an out string, right, and basically reuse this piece of code over here. Okay, and then if uh, this print fp variable is true, then I'm just going to append to this out string another string that says what the false um, the false positive probability was, and you can see that this is already uh, defined over here. All right, so I've saved that. Thanks. All right, so let's see if that works. Okay, so um, when I set the F flag, I'm getting a false positive probability, although it doesn't make much sense because it's negative. Um, and when the F isn't there, then it's working just as normal. So um, at least setting the option seems to be working. Okay, all right. So, uh, all right, let's go back to the instructions. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so as we saw over here, um, there's a bug. Uh, it's giving us negative probabilities. Um, so we, we have to, uh, to find this bug. And that's going to be in this Python file. And let's see, since I did this already, there we go. So Josh had a little spirit vision. Uh, so uh, we're going we're gonna to remove this bug. And um, what you initially might be tempted to do if you're making a change to a code is do, is do something like that. Um, and I've worked with code that has a lot of that. And this sort of runs against like, the philosophy of Git. Um, and Git's a beautiful tool. And what it lets you do is just be okay with deleting code, right? Because it's not going away. You're keeping track of everything you do. So let's get rid of all of that, all right? It's okay. All right, so we've saved that. Okay, and finally, we're gonna look at the readme and just bump up the version number, all right? And, uh, and also document our changes. So, uh, you know, dash F prints out false positive rate. Okay. Okay, so now um, we're going to commit these changes. Okay? So every commit involves typing git add something and then git commit. Okay, so basically add, adding it set, lets git know that you're ready to commit something, that, you wanna, that you're, you're letting it know which files that you're, um, you're telling it to track. And then git commit actually lets you write a message um, and actually commits those files in. So it's a two-step process. A, hand, a handy command is git status, all right? And it shows, uh, shows you that since the last commit, all right, so since we, um, we made the second branch called work. Uh, there are three modified files in there, the readme, bloom.py, and indict. All right, so the first commit uh, is the commit fixing the bug in the false positive rate. So uh, that was in bloom.py. So we're gonna do git add bloom.py. Okay, let's take a look at what happened to um, git status. Okay, so you see that the output of that changed a little bit. Um, so it says changes to be committed. Okay, so we've added that. So now if we commit, it's going to basically track the changes on bloom.py. But these other things are changed but not updated. So if we were to commit that, these things would still be modified and untracked. All right, so let's commit that. Just git commit. What that does is it pops me um, into an editor. This is just um, the terminal version of Emacs. Um, and I'm going to make, just write a little uh, message um, saying what we did. So 
uh, you know, we fixed uh, you know, Josh's spirit vision. Okay? We're going to exit out of that, and it automatically... One of many. We fixed one of many spirit visions. Um, well, yeah, we haven't tested it yet. That's a good point. All right, there we go. So, all right, thanks. So that actually might have been a good example if we hadn't to, to show git amend. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, so now we want to do another um, commit. Um, but before I do that, um, let's, I want to show you uh, how to use this git diff, right? So we've made a commit, um, and if we, if we want to see what the difference is between where we are now and the uh, last commit, we can run this command called git diff. And basically, this shows the difference between the current version of the files right, as they are in my directory and what they were at the last commit. Okay? So you can see that um, it's, it's a little hard to read at first, but it's telling you that the readme has changed. right? And uh, you know this minus tells you that I've deleted this line with minus, and the plus tells tells you that you've replaced it with this. Um, and then also, uh, there should be this uh, index has also been changed. Okay, and I actually find that um, a nicer way to look at this um, is with color words, um, because it sort of gives you a more Wikipedia style representation of the changes. So basically, um, red things are deletions, green things are additions, and then white things have been unchanged, but, they, um, but Git includes that for some context. All right, so this is a good way to see what the, so Git dip with no arguments tells you the difference between what you've got in your current directory and the last commit. Um, you can get a little fancier um, if, you want to take a look at the difference between two commits that are somewhere, anywhere in the log, right? So we can look at the difference between, uh, let's say, this commit and that commit. And you just need to specify, specify them by the SHA. Um, and you don't actually need to type in all of these characters. You can usually do it with just a couple, all right? So um, basically what this is telling you is that the only difference between those two commits was the, um, the, the change in the spirit, spirit vision. So I deleted all of this text. Okay, so let's go through and, um, and, and, add, and add and commit. So um, let's add the, uh, the change that we made to the readme. All right, so get status says that we've modified the readme and it's ready to go in. Here's um, sort of a nice little shortcut. Um, this git commit dash m. A lot of the times your commits are fairly minor and you can just um, you know, say them with one line. Um, so this could be you know, updated readme, something like that. All right. So I, didn't, I wasn't popped into an editor. I just did that with um, uh, one line on the command line. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the last thing that we want to add is the change to uh, indict. Um, and so the last thing, uh, the last sort of shortcut I'll show you is git commit dash a basically says take everything um, that ha everything that's modified and not added, add it, and then commit. Okay, so uh, you know if you have a lot of things that you need to add, um, you know you can just run with this, and then this dash m uh, lets you do the shorthand form of the message. Um, okay, so okay, actually, so this so the modification to indict was actually. Um, was actually different from the version number. Um, OK, so uh, new, let's see, new option in indict. OK, all right, so we've made all the changes. So git status says nothing to, to commit. Everything is up to date. 
And so the last thing we want to do is merge uh, the changes we've made in the work branch back onto the master branch. So how do we go back to the master branch? Yep. So master, all right, so that command wanted to create a new branch named master, and it complained because there was one that was, yeah, exactly. OK? All right, on branch master. Um, so then we can just do git merge work. So what that's going to do is we're here. We're on master. This is where we are right now. Work has moved ahead by several commits. And basically what we want, what we want to do is basically um, merge in all of those commits and basically fast forward master so that it's all the way up here. Okay, so we've done that, um, and then it gives sort of a little summary of the changes. So I think what this means is we've, uh, you know, we've modified five lines and we've added four and subtracted one, something like that. Um, okay, and I guess the last thing we want to do is uh, is tag it. Get tag. You want to show uh, what the branches are now? Like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing actually that um, that exists are these nice uh, sort of GUIs for visualizing your you know your Git commit tree. Um, and here's one that just came with my version of Git. Um, I'm not going to you know pretend that it's great, but um, what it tells you is basically it shows you where you are, um, and it gives you a little summary of the previous commits, and then also the diffs between each commit and the previous one. Um, so we'll sort of let you visualize. And if you've got many trees, you can imagine that this structure over here could become um, fairly complicated. OK. And I actually forgot how to tag stuff. So does anyone want to give me some help? Ah. Okay, uh, let's see. So, all right. So, I'm guessing it's git help tag. All right, and then. All right, so you can see that this tag has been added to the current. So just a little addition. Um, if you use a dash A for the git tag command, it's, it's what we call an annotated tag. So it will actually annotate with the author and the time, which is usually what you want. So this, what you did here is a, kind of a lightweight tag. So it just kind of creates a tag pretty quickly. Uh, but if you want to have a, a, get, a version release, you usually do an annotated tag. Okay. So basically, you can think about it. It's the same uh, shortcuts that you, that you do with commit is dash a for annotated and dash m to create a message on that annotated. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't actually um, seen tag before today. So, what's the purpose of the tag? Purpose? Um, it's basically just putting a label on the state. So you say, okay, now this is something that I, this is a milestone for my software. I want to give it a release name, or I want to say something about that. And then you can always go back and check that out. So uh, imagine that after two years, you still think that version one was better. You can actually go back to version one. You don't have to figure out which commit was it that, that corresponded to version one. Yeah. If you merge them, why does it still say up there that your branch is ahead of master by three commits? Origin. So origin master refers um, to the branch that's on GitHub, right? Oh. So we cloned uh, that repo. 
So um, yeah, so that, that version of master on origin is still behind us. So we would have to push, um, we'd have to push to the Git repo on GitHub to make that one um, come up, you know, up to toward our current branch. Yeah. So the question was, um, do you want to delete? Um, do you want to delete a branch? And that's kind of um, that's sort of up to you. Um, but you know, if if you're not going to be doing any more work in that, then you know, there's no harm uh, in deleting it. Uh, all the changes were passed on to master, so there's nothing sort of unique in, in work anymore. Um, so I think use git help branch. So I think, let's see, this dash D means delete the branch name. So git branch D work. Okay, so I deleted that. Um, so now uh, git branch just shows master. Now how do we go back to what we realized Okay, so the question was, uh, yeah, so how do we go back if we, if we realize that, um, that we made a, a, a bad commit? Um, so basically, um, sort of going to a specific branch, uh, you always basically call git checkout. Um, you know, that basically brings you back to the version um, you know, at that specific commit. So let's do a git log, right? So we fixed Josh's spirit vision. So then let's go to the one before that. So we'll copy the first part of the SHA. Then we can do git checkout. OK. So um, now if we open up that file again, uh, yeah. So you can see that this code uh, has reappeared. We're, we're at, at exactly the same state as we were before we made the, the commit where I said that I fixed it. So if we want to make that the new stable spot, we can recommit the checkout? Yeah, so um, let's see. So I think what we would want to do um, is basically follow this over here. Um, so I don't know. Let's let's call this spirit. Yeah. So what git checkout slash b spirit did was it basically said create a branch called spirit and then uh, you know check out that branch. So now if I do git status, it says I'm on branch spirit. Uh, git branch should say that there are two. I'm on spirit, and now we can start going and you know making new improvements to spirit vision. But you could move over to master and then merge spirit into master. But the problem with that is that you have all the new changes. Sorry, the spirit hasn't, doesn't know about the changes you made after spirit. But you're pointing to the first sort of hack that you did. But if you now did a merge, that would give you back exactly what you want. Right? You've got, got all the other changes to the other files, but you've got um, this spirit vision back in. So let's take a look at this. Um, sort of representation over here. So it basically says that we've, we've moved back um, in the tree. And then if I switch to master, all right, and then I update this, all right? So you see that we switched and we moved forward by three commits. Okay, so we can basically just go back and forth. And if these two things diverged, you would see these two branches sort of split off. And then, you know, you'd be hopping back and forth, you know, on these leaves. Now we have to want to merge master and spirit. And have to that to do that merge into that one uh, Yeah, so if we, yeah, so if you wanted to merge all right, so let's move into spirit. Okay, and then git merge master. 
Okay, so that basically applied the same three commits on top of Spirit. Um, and then if I update that, you see that the current, uh, the current leaf is, you know, we're on Spirit. But that version of Spirit now is the same as the latest release of Master. So they're essentially they're the same code base at this point. We've now gotten rid of the, the Spirit version? No, that's, that's still around, but we've updated all of the um, changes that we made since we deleted uh, the Spirit vision. So none of, none of these commits have been lost anywhere. I could easily just you know, go back and do the same exercise again, where I went back, I checked out that old commit, then I created a new branch um, and you know, done more work on that branch. Is, is there a way to, to just check out an older version of one file from say, an older commit? Yeah, so, um, so I believe the way to do that, let's, let's check out that, um, that spirit vision. All right, so uh, we want to check out this commit. So git check out. Uh, that's the commit. And then uh, the file was bloom.py. OK, so right now I've just I've pulled over a specific file from that old, older commit. Um, and then if I take a look at that file, it's got the it's got the spirit vision in it. So uh, yeah, so basically, I've modified bloom.py. I've basically you know put the spirit vision back in effectively. So git diff, uh, then I'll do the color words. Uh, dash dash cash. Okay. So that's because I haven't added, I, I haven't uh, staged bloom.py yet, or what? No, you did stage it. Before. Oh, okay. All right. If you, if you see, it says up there, it says changes to be committed, and that's where it listed the mod. Okay. Okay. So, just a couple more things to say um, about Git, and then we'll do the homework. Maybe. Um, here's GitHub. Here's. Uh, me logged in to GitHub, and the nice thing is you can see all the different repositories that you're following, and sort of more or less a stream of what's happening um, in those repositories. And the thing that we can um, tell you now, not that we're really hiding it, is that there's a public repository called Python Bootcamp, and this has all of the um, edits and all of the additions that we've been making as counselors over the last. Uh, a week or so, and you can see as we're all basically different people are committing, um, you'll wind up seeing all the different, uh, you'll see all the different names here, and I can see what Barian's done and get to his homepage. Um, uh, here, Isaac is the one who did the last commit. I can look at the data files, um, not be math files, data.txt. Um, so GitHub knows how to render certain types of files for you nicely. In particular, it's pretty good at um, rendering Python files. It makes it nice and pretty. And you can look at the history of that. That's a pretty boring history because I haven't changed much. I just added it once. But if we were constantly changing that, you'd see it. There's the thing about blame. If I actually just want the raw data, I can link to that. Um, it doesn't yet know how to mark up IPython notebooks, but the, that NB viewer thing is sort of a, a starting point here. So here you see this is essentially just JSON. 
for those that are comfortable and familiar with that. Um, but uh, it's a pretty nice environment to, to work in. Um, and you can even see that it knows how to render markdown, which is basically how we worked on the schedule. And people can change their name, you know, change what they're willing to work on and things like that. Um, and we basically did all of our development of the boot camp within GitHub in a public way. Um, so we weren't blaming each other for too many things. We can take a look at how this all wound up um, getting developed over time. This is a calendar essentially up here, and I can scroll around. And what you see here are these different, um, why this? Oh. Should be able to, it should pop up and show me, there we go. So here Henrik did some merge. Um, I merged some branch back onto the main branch. And you can see all the different commits that people are making. Um, over time, and here's where we are now at the master. So it's a pretty nice way to follow um, the development of a, in this case, we're not really developing a large code, we're developing the class, right? And now that this is public, anyone else, when they find out about this, will be able to fork this um, repository, make changes, do whatever they want, and there's only certain people uh, who I have, because I created this, who I have given, um, access to to basically be able to commit. If somebody actually wanted to commit something um, and they didn't have that access, they could issue a pull request. I could look at that stuff and I could make a decision whether I want to pull that in or not. They can still commit locally if they want to push something. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah, they can commit locally. They can build an entire other thing and eventually it'll become a Perl boot camp, right? <laughs> um, and they'll reuse all of our slides and they'll just take all the Python out. And then they're going to say, I want to merge this into the Python bootcamp. And I'll say, absolutely not, right? But then they'll just have their own repository. And now they've got something which is just totally different. But they will retain the full history of how everything um, uh, got developed. So you can see we've got open repositories. I have a couple closed repositories, like for writing a paper. And I'm just, I just want to have a place to push this to. And I've got a few other collaborators. And I want everyone to see all my dirty laundry. Um, but I do want to keep all my version history. That's a that's a totally fine way to go about it. Um, you have a question? Yeah. Is there a question? Yes. So all the current versions from Bootcamp are they pushed to the Agenda website? What's that? All the all the current versions in Bootcamp on GitHub are they all pushed to the Agenda page? Yeah. So basically, if you notice, if you just mouse over a lot of those links, a lot of them are just pointing back to the um, GitHub. And so like all the notebooks, as soon as I update a notebook, effectively the agenda page is updated without us having to do anything. Um, you generally think about pushing files like Python files and scripts and um, maybe a couple of text files over. I've been pushing over keynote files, which are basically binary files, and pushing over PDFs. That's generally, I would say, frowned upon to be sort of polluting your repository with binary files that, because if somebody wants to clone it, it's going to be like a hundred meg uh, directory because it's a lot of binary stuff. It's not illegal. Um, it's still open and free, so anyone can use it. Um, but generally, what you wind up doing with uh, with Git is that you more or less are think about it as sort of committing more or less code that you're writing, or if you're writing LaTeX or something commit that. But once you start committing large amounts of binary files, that's not usually a good idea. You usually want to sort of point off to another place where that data um, might live. I felt like we had just a few enough number of uh, PDFs and keynote files that it would be okay to, to put it in there and no one would get too upset about it. Um, so GitHub uh, has as their um, mascot uh, something called Octocat. And there's lots of different incarnations of Octocat, which you can get at here, Octodex. Um, their artists have, are apparently paid way too much and have way too much free time. Um, somewhere on here, there's an Obama version of the Octocat. There it is. Yes, we code. So now you know where that comes from. And there's the Tron version of that as well. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool company, and um, there has, I think, um, uh, Henrik said they're kind of doing great things for um, sort of development in general. So we're hoping that all of you will wind up adopting Git, but then um, many of you, if you are able to work in an open environment, 
will use something like that, uh, something like GitHub. And they're not paying us that much to say stuff like this, <laughs> just, just in case. OK, so um, let's take a look at the homework. Were there any other questions about Git? No? OK. So homework two is um, essentially a simulation. It's a Monte Carlo simulation. And when in Monte Carlo, you should be thinking about money. Um, so we have a question, basically. Um, and we, uh, we have this notion that we walk around all day, we pay for stuff with cash. Um, and if you have credit cards and you have debit cards, you just pay with that. But in the olden days, we used to walk around and we used to have cash in our pockets and we used to pay for stuff. And the probability that you have to pay exactly $1, exactly $5 is obviously pretty small, um, especially if you go to the supermarket. You more or less have a random chance of the final bill being between uh, zero and 99 cents with some integer offset from that, right? So the question we want to know is, at the end of the day, after you've paid with X number of um, uh, you know, transactions, how much change are you accumulating? And now we want to know how much change are you accumulating, say, at the end of the year. And I want to know the distribution of coins in your money jar at the end. So we have um, a couple of different ways in which uh, we set up this problem. And you'll be essentially implementing this. And obviously, we want, to think, we want you to think about this in an object-oriented way. You make X purchases each day with petty cash, starting out with only bills in your pocket. That is, you start off with lots of bills. You've got no change in your pocket. Each purchase has a random chance of costing some dollar amount plus YY cents, where YY goes from 0 to 99. You always get change in the smallest number of coins possible. For instance, if you have a purchase for $2.34, and you assume you acquire 66 cents and change, and the smallest number of, uh, of a, uh, coins that you can get back for that is two quarters, one dime, one nickel, and one penny. If you have enough change to cover the YY cents uh, of the current transaction in your pocket, because you're accumulating that throughout the day, you use it. Otherwise, you accumulate more change. For example, if you have a dollar and two cents in loose change, and you have a purchase of $10.34, then you use 34 cents, or as close as possible, in coins, leaving you with 68 cents. Um, we're not being exact about how to do this in all the edge cases, so you'll have to figure out how you want to implement this. At the end of the day, you dump all the coins that you collected in the day into your money jar. Here are the questions that we can now ask once you set up the simulation. What is the average amount of change accumulated each year, assuming x equals 5? That is, you have 5 transactions a day. Um, what's the one sigma scatter about this quantity? So you're basically going to run many, many iterations of this where you're setting x equals 5. And because you have a random number generator as part of all this, that is how many, uh, what's the value of the transaction that you're doing, where you're doing five transactions, um, you're not always going to have the same amount at the end of the year. right? And so we want to know what is the total amount of change that you've accumulated and what is sort of the scatter about that. If you think of this as a normal distribution, this is the one sigma. This is sort of what encapsulates 68% of, 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 uh, of all the trials that you make. What coin, quarter, dime, nickel, or penny, are you most likely to accumulate over time? What's the second most likely? And does your answer depend upon x? So if I only do one transaction a day, do I get a different answer for the total number of coins that I have than if I do 10 transactions a day? And you can choose a couple of different x's to try to figure this out. I thought this was a very interesting question. I always want to know this answer. When you're a professor, you want to know something, you just assign it. And then you hope somebody comes up with an elegant solution to it. Um, let's say you need eight quarters per week to do laundry. How many quarters do you have at the end of the year? If you don't have enough quarters at the end of each week, use only what you have. So effectively, you go each week now, not every day, but you now look in your cookie jar or your money jar, and you say, how many quarters do I need? I need, I need eight. You pull those out. So you're draining your quarters on a weekly basis. OK, so here's how we think this might happen. Write a class called cookie jar that knows how many coins it has inside, how many transactions is completed, how long it has been filled for, et cetera. You might write a function which takes an input um, a transaction amount and returns a total number of coins as change in, the diction in a dictionary. Um, for example, if I said calc change 3.45, uh, that means that I have to generate 55 cents in change 
and so you need to go through the logic to figure out um, uh, figure out how many coins uh, you're getting back. Um, in your run, you might instantiate the cookie jar and um, have its run method perform all the transactions for one year, and maybe you do this 50 times so you can get a good uh, sense of the spread of the results. This will take a little while to run, and it'll take a little while to code, but that's why you have tonight. <laughs> I told you it was gonna be painful. Um, any questions about sort of the setup and how you might go about this? Everyone's got it? Is it interesting enough to keep you motivated to write object oriented code? Sort of? The winner gets a quarter. Are there particular advantages to doing it object oriented in something like this when you only have one specific cookie jar? Um, well, there's a couple, one which we won't really show you how to do for tonight, but you'll see tomorrow, is that you could run 50 parallel instances of a cookie jar. So you could run it over multiple cores on your computer, right? So if you've got eight cores, you could use all cores to run as many cookie jars as you can per year. Um, if you want to go outside of your computer, you can use all the great parallelism that's exposed to you in IPython and run it on an Amazon web instance, or Amazon web uh, thing, right? So you could actually spin up a whole bunch of computers and you just ask this 50 times and you, with the same exact parameters, pull back the results and do that. Um, you don't have to do this in an object-oriented object way, but the idea that you've got, a trend, you've got a bunch of transactions, you're saving the results into those transactions, makes sense that the sort of atom of what it is that you're carrying around is actually the physical thing that you're carrying around, which is the cookie jar. You could go even more atomized from that and talk about you know, an object being in your pocket, right? And what's inside of your pocket. That's much more of a container. But the idea that you as a person are walking around and you're doing transactions, think of a transaction as a method that essentially operates effectively on the cookie jar, right? Yes? The way it's originally written, it says you dump the change in the cookie jar at the end of the day, so you also need a pocket class. You could do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not trying to say there's only one class, but I was thinking of cookie jar as perhaps the base class. Yeah. You could imagine pocket as a subclass of a cookie jar. Any other questions? Um, so uh, we'll be around for a little bit now. If people want to start coding, um, and then tonight some of us will try to be on the IRC channel. If you need help immediately and you're not getting it, um, just send us an email and we'll also try to respond to that very quickly. We'll see you all tomorrow.